Hello everyone, Ladislas Maurice from TheWanderingInvestor.com. So today we're going to be having a very interesting discussion on geopolitics and risks for 2024 together with Dr. Tuomas Malinen, who is an associate professor at the University of Helsinki and who is also the co-founder of a Helsinki-based research service on geopolitics and economics. Professor, how are you? Uh, fine, thank you. It's, uh, you don't, of course, see it, but it's a beautiful weather outside here in, here in beautiful El Salvador. And uh, I've been here a week and it's been a great week. Yeah. So I was on, so I've been following Professor Melinen for a few years now on Twitter. I really enjoy following him. Um, and I saw that he was in El Salvador at the same time that I'm here. So I reached out to him and this is how we're now making this video. Look, I have been very <coughs> disturbed by some of your latest thoughts mm. slash uh, projections. And why? Because one, they're, they're quite negative going forward which I understand, but I, the extent of the negativity is a little worrying. Mm. Why? Because you have been so right. I've been following you for a few years and your projections have generally been very accurate mm. um, and disturbingly so. So when I hear you mentioning that 2024 could prove to be a very bad year for people, mm. um, I'm listening. So I'm not saying that what Professor Melinen is going to expand on is my base case, but I'm certainly listening to him and I'm taking this into account in my own risk analysis for my portfolio. Yeah, uh, we are actually at, at GNS Economics, which is the firm we currently concentrated on like two paths. First is we analyze the current data and you know make projections of how the markets are gonna go, what's gonna happen with the economy, and then we have the worst case scenario, scenario which we follow uh, also. And quite worryingly, the worst case scenario has, has uh, kind of been playing forward in the back background, which I maybe didn't even suspect that it would in such accuracy, which it has done or has been going. And this concerns many developments, not just in the economy, but for example, what what is what has and is happening in Ukraine. Because, I mean, I remember when the, when the war started, you were amongst the first uh, publicly on Twitter and in your analysis for your, for your members or people who, who follow you, you were amongst the first to say that Ukraine is going to lose this war mm. and the biggest loser will be Europe. Yeah, uh, there were like, let's say, um, some accounts in, in Twitter and elsewhere, kind of as people with, let's say, less visible profile who already raised this issue before me. But I was probably, you know, not, if not the first, among the first who really came out from, well, coming from the establishment, establishment as I am, and saying that, what if, what if we have gotten the whole thing wrong? So, like, when the war started, and of course, as a Finn, there was just an outpour, outpour of a sympathy towards Ukraine, also on my part, like on my tweets and all, because, you know, we, it first it looked like, okay, Russia is now trying to invade another country. The same thing it did to Finland in 39, uh, and then we, which led to eventually continuation for war. So we had war pretty much from 39 to 44, and we lost 12% uh, of our land mass in that fight. So it started with an outpouring uh, support for Ukraine. But then we, when we published a special report on the, on the war in, at the end of March in uh, uh, 2020, and our base case scenario was there that uh, the truce will be agreed uh, or reached somewhere in, in May, because Russia has taken what it said it wanted to take, the east, Crimea, it had a land bridge, uh, and they are, then they will negotiate. There is no point of the war continuing beyond that point. When you get like, when you get to April, you get the mud season in, in Ukraine, which makes it really difficult to, uh, you know, uh, go in, uh, in this kind of uh, attacks led by uh, battle tanks and all that. And so we, okay, that's what the base case. The worst case was that the war drags on and even spreads. And then come, <clears throat> 
end of July, I started to think that now something doesn't add up. So why, why, why there was no talk about truce uh, and, you know, the Russian progression and all that, there was just something off. It, it didn't, it did not follow the logic that wars, these kinds of wars usually do. So I started to ask questions. It was early August, I started to ask questions. What is actually happening in Ukraine? What has happened in Ukraine and where is it going? And there was a, uh, quite probably the, one of the biggest turning, turning points was that I was in a conference in early, early September. I met a person who had a family in Kharkiv. And, uh, well, this person lived elsewhere, but I asked that, what, is it true what has been told to us by the mainstream media or from Harkiv? Is it really, has it really gone like that? And answer was no. I asked, was there such massive Russian losses as we've been told? The answer was no. Russians had left days prior when the Ukrainians come, and then what I heard, they started shooting in the heart with long range artillery to and inflict, inflicted quite heavy damage. And these and a few other blocks I read from, uh, they were, it was actually one block, uh, it turned out to be there were two former, yeah, okay, three former, I, I forgot the names, but anyway, they, they, they former US Marines. And they wrote first under a pseudonym an explanation of the Russian war tactics in Ukraine, which were basically that when they progressed, the East was fortified immediately. And uh, the Southeast, they uh, fortified it, and then they started to bring Russian infrastructure, you know, uh, bureaucratic control, all that. They, they uh, started to turn it Russian. So they had it under the East, but then they just fortified their positions. Nothing this was done in the North. So it seemed quite obvious that the North was just a bargaining chip and a, and a play to distribute Ukrainian forces all over. As the Russia came in Ukraine, it was, well, they say they had 200,000 troops, so probably they had far less. So it, the, it, the plan never was to invade. It was to get the East. And then you start, started to think, that I started to think, what is, what is the logic, what is the motivation behind it? And it, it led to several discoveries. But the first one was my question, I think it was published, it was published in my newsletter, I think it was middle of September, where I asked, what if we got it wrong on the Russia-Ukrainian war? And of course it led to a, a massive backlash you know, people call me all kinds of names and, well, it's just essential wild crap, which I got. Well, I, I have gotten so used to it, so it didn't bother me much. But still, that I, I presented a case where Ukrainian losses were considerably higher than Russian and what, it, what has been told to us, and that the Russian tactic never was to invade Ukraine. And yeah, all the out, outcry, especially. In, in Finland, and they are but, and and in in October I stated that I think the Ukraine has already lost the war a year ago in October, similarly to outcry. But the developments were so clear in Ukraine at, at that point that I uh, I thought that this is this is a call I need to make, you know, because you see the trajectory, you see where it's going, and yeah, so. And now we are at the stage with where I really never wanted to be in my lifetime. Like, I was born in 76, and we lived right next to Soviet Union, in Finland, for, of course, for a long time. And I actually visited, uh, my relatives were working at the Finnish embassies in Moscow and then in St. Petersburg. As a 10-year-old as a kid, I visited Soviet Union two times. It was rather interesting. I still have very vivid memories of it. But it was a superpower that then. And after Soviet Union was dismantled, there was like all the military threat went away. 
But now Russia has been fighting NATO trained troops and NATO gear for a year and a half. And they have come really good at it. And I think the Russian military currently is as its best, best shape since the 1940s. And it is really the second, even if not the first, army in the world right now. It's in direct competition with the US. And this has been a cataclysmic uh, geopolitical, geopolitical and strategic plunder from NATO and, and from the Biden administration. A catastrophic mistake to go into this proxy war with Ukraine. So, and it, for me it became clear <coughs> also that it was a proxy war in, a, in about January when I started to really to study the history of NATO and all that. Uh, and then I realized that it was probably U.S. that pushed the escalation to a point in Ukraine that led to a response, military response from Russia. And we can talk about the details shortly, but in January also, one of my American friends, who is very far from being any, any kind of conspiracy theorist or anything like that, he said, um, he said to me that if Mexico would be joining Russia in a military alliance and would be sh uh, shelling Texas, there would be no Mexico, no more. The U.S. would have taken over it, U.S. troops. And this is, when you think about Ukraine, Ukraine is the same to Russia as Mexico is to the United States. And this is a geopolitical game and yeah. So where, where does this take us? Well, there's one other thing I need to mention. I had a, uh, I, can, I couldn't, I unfortunately cannot find the uh, piece anymore, but a, um, a long-term political correspondent and journalist in the US wrote a, wrote a piece in May. I don't remember if it was his personal blog or whatever. I just, I read it and it, it basically he, in it he stated that the aim of the Russo-Ukrainian war was to dismantle the Eurasian Union that was forming between Europe, China, and Russia. And as we can now see, it, it, if, the, if that was the aim, it was a, a complete success to the US, in that sense at least. But where this leaves us is that Europe is weaker than it has been since the 1950s. There is a uh, direct threat of this war continuing to other places from Ukraine because NATO is about or is has already but is not yet publicly acknowledged. NATO leaders are actually smoothing their way into it. There was just two weeks ago Jens Stoltenberg, the general secretary of NATO, stated that you should not underestimate Russia. And I, when I see it, okay, oh, I, I thought, okay, now they are making the way uh, to uh, publicly admit that they're defeated by this great army of Russia, which way they first thought was rubbish. So, but this has been a huge blow to the credibility of NATO, or when the losses, uh, oh, there's actually two options here now, uh, with, the, with the Ukraine for NATO. Either they, or three, either Ukraine, or Ukrainian military command or something, they, they make a truce with Russia, essentially surrender. There's a Western-led truce and peace. Or then uh, there is a massive escalation on the side of NATO. So there's a three options basically left. Ukrainian surrender, uh, generally negotiated peace or an escalation. And <clears throat> people have been asking me that how do I see this going? And if we now try to look to the crystal ball a bit, is Joe Biden is now, he's first of all, He's become another U.S. president who has lost the war in Ukraine, and the economy is about to tank. So, and you don't win elections with those. So, what do you do when you have such a desperate situation? You start wars. Wars are popular often, at least if you have a good reason to present 
to, to the general populace. So it's my take that it, it's really difficult to calculate the likelihoods, but it, it, it's, it's worryingly high that NATO will try to escalate this conflict somehow during this spring. After the summer, it's too late because you have to concentrate on the US, US presidential elections. So I think it's either the war in Ukraine or also er elsewhere escalates this spring, or then we have about five years of peace because it's likely that Donald Trump will be uh, uh, elected and he will tr strive for peace everywhere. So that's kind of, well, it's, a, I don't know, it's a worst case scenario, but it's, it's the way of thinking I have now. And the thing is that people really should understand how chaotic this thing can get all over the world. It's just in Ukraine, it's also Middle East, and the ramifications from there could be utterly devastating to gas markets, oil markets, the global economy. It is basically, I wrote a piece uh, called The Sword of Damocles, which is you know, the, the sword hanging above the global economy, which was the war in the Middle East. If, it's, if it becomes a regional war, then we have serious trouble. We would see, we would probably see economic destruction of, of like unseen scale, at least for several centuries. It would be complete devastation. We can talk about specifics of that also a bit later, but where this all leads us to is, is a very precarious, very dangerous, fragile situation, which I don't think uh, investors or people in general are fully acknowledging. This is the most dangerous phase the world has been since at least the 1930s. This is a very dangerous situation for Europe and for the world. And if these things get in motion the wrong way, kind of the worst case scenario starts to play out, and you're not prepared, you will be annihilated completely. People don't, for example, understand that if, if there would be a war in Europe, the laws in place during a war are very different than what they are during the peacetime. And yeah, your privileges, your freedoms, many of those things will, would be taken away and you would not be able, uh, this thing we are having now, this discussion cannot be, it, it will not, would not be allowed to go through or, or be public in any of the outlets controlled by any, you know, the, of the globalist forces or local media or whatever. Censorship would be very heavy. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very chaotic, scenario, the, 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 the worst case one, where we could end up to. So, but in your mind, the worst case scenario is relatively likely? It's, it's much more likely than I would likely like to, ha to have. Are you acting on it with your own personal portfolio? Yes, of course. So, for example, concretely, what are, what are you doing? Well, I'm, well, I won't go into specifics, but I'm here in El Salvador. It, this was not a, not a pleasure trip. Also, I had fun too. This is a business trip. If we have a war in Europe and it will spread probably the US also then, so you need to look up a place where it's unlikely to be any part of that war. And Latin America is, is one of those places. What about um, countries that have been trying, that are in NATO, but that have been trying hard to distance themselves from NATO policies, such as Hungary, um, Turkey. Where do you see such countries heading in, in such a scenario? The, I, I think they will resign from NATO. That's the only reasonable thing to do in, in that case. I think uh, hung, Hungarian Prime Minister Orban has already hinted something like that. I was in Hungary uh, three times in, in conferences during the past year and a half and talk a lot with you know, academics and all of people of, uh, of, from business background. And it seems that the cleansing of the military 
was done to make sure that the leaders of Hungarian military are really loyal to the people and not to NATO. So I think the NATO hawks are all gone. So they have been preparing for the option that something goes horribly wrong with NATO and there's a war between Russia. It, it, there is absolutely no point of any European country to participate in such an atrocity. There is no point. Yeah. Because Russia is not like Soviet Union was a formidable force in the sense that it could actually, there was a theoretical possibility that it could run over Western Europe and control it. Russia has no such, uh, no such muscles. It has that strength it lacks. It has, it has no very strong military, but economically otherwise it, it could not, and we will not rule. It's just Russia, Russia's thinking, it, they, it just wants the kind of a line of land mass, which is not threatening them. And they, are, they, they treat NATO as a threat. So they want just this land mass. Which is not. Does that uh, landmass include Odessa and Transnistria? I don't know. Very honestly, I'm not. We're not. We are not geopolitical experts in that sense that we would go to these details. We just analyze the uh, general, like global geopolitical structures, and now concentrating in, in Europe. But I would say that it would include Finland, for example, too, and Finland in NATO could do much good by joining with uh, uh, with uh, Hungary and Turkey of objecting this aggression towards Russia. But it's Finnish is currently run by Russophobic leaders, unfortunately. And if Alexander Stoop uh, wins the elections, then it's a checkmate. They hold all the key points. I couldn't believe when I first heard it, but they actually brought a destroyed, Russian destroyed T-72 battle tank from Ukraine to Helsinki. I, it, it, I, I really, I, I had a hard time understanding before I went and say, saw it myself. So they just display it? They display it in one of the squares. And this kind of provocation is just unheard of. If they would have brought a destroyed Leopard tank from Ukraine to Moscow, the amount of outcry in Finland would have been massive, and for a reason. And these are, not, Finland is currently being controlled by really dangerous people, in a sense that they have this Russophobic mentality, which they don't understand even. They don't understand what's Russia about. And so they're acting on the prime instincts. and. The most in, one of the most interesting thing is that this was said by Douglas McGregor. I, I heard his interview. Uh, you can look him up if you don't know who he is, but he's a former uh, military commander from the U.S. And he had an interview. Uh, I listened to the I think yesterday morning or something like that. And he explained how the U.S. is is a, a air and naval force. It's not a ground force. They don't have such army anymore. And what Finland has is a ground force, very formidable ground force, modern, well-trained. So NATO definitely wanted Finland, if they want to engage a war with Russia, for example. And, you know, the actual date of ascension of Finland as a full member of NATO was the date in April, I think it was nine, when NATO was founded. That's just, that gives a signal. Now I think, I think this was a signal. Now NATO is now complete and ready to complete its original mission, which is possible is that it's uh, the destruction of Russia uh, or before that the Soviet Union. I think NATO was actually set up for that. In any case, for for Finland, um, it had a during the whole. Cold War it had a privileged position of being in between, yeah. being able to play the Soviet Union, being able to play the the Western Bloc, yeah. trading with both. You were in a sweet spot, yeah. We and were. you did you did very well from it, yeah. Um, and sometimes I wonder what happened. How, how how do politicians and the electorate, especially the electorate, not remember how much of a sweet spot it was for Finland? It was not raised. 
the, the, that, that history was forgotten and it was, it was given a um, negative tone called Finlandization, which means that we bowed to Moscow, although we both bowed and, well, essentially showed our ass too. So we really ripped the Soviet Union off. Mm -hmm. We're in good terms, but we ripped them off. We mm -hmm. got that. We benefited massively from yeah. the Eastern trade. And because I, I see why the West would want Finland in NATO, yeah. I totally get that. Yeah. Um, you know, I see why the Germans wouldn't want you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't. I, I, but the, for Finland, the, it makes no sense. The propaganda campaign in Finland after Russia launched that it, its, its war against Ukraine was massive. It fueled the very things that. Basically, we, you know, we fought war. With the, the war, our war memories. Russia is doing it again. All that, all that. It, 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 the propaganda has been continuing till the date, and it, it has like two main points. One is that Russia is evil, and second is that Russia is weak, and both are wrong. So I don't I, like. There's a, all of us who have operated somehow or that they uh, who have had relatives or close people who have operated with Russia and, and done business all that you know how it operates mm -hmm. you need to have a leverage and then you can uh, negotiate mm -hmm. if you don't have the leverage you're screwed so you do not go and trust Russians you don't do that no never because yeah, I mean you said Russia's not evil mm -hmm. I mean Russia's never really nice I mean <laughs> really Russia, Russia is not particularly nice. No, no, no of you course know. not. No, no, no. He's not. No, and and it's uh, how the Winter Churchill put it. Russia is an enigma wrapped inside of damn, forgot. But anyway, it's good. Yeah, it's 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 a mystery in many ways. But you, when you just understand that they they don't re like Obama tried diplomacy with Russians failed miserably, miserably. So, but what you they they don't trust in diplomacy. They trust in power. Yeah threat of it, not using it, threat of it. And that's like what Finland did. We had, we built a very formidable army and there was actually, I think uh, we had the um, treaty, it's the UUR treaty, when I forgot what it was in, peace and cooperation, something like that, which was basically set up so that it, we, we, it wouldn't take us into Warsaw Pact, so we stayed out, so we it's 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 a strike of genius from uh, from uh, President Pasikivi at the time, uh, and uh, Urho Kekkonen, the president the, who came to president after that was a foreign minister I think at the time, and there was a alliance were forming, and Finland of course didn't want to get dragged in the Warsaw Pact, so they agreed that what what if we have this that we go we 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 will not go to the Warsaw Pact but we will promise that no harm will come to Soviet Union. To, through Finland. So there's actually wording in the contract that all forces from Germany or its allies, so Germany was the risk and not the US. A, we formally con had a contract on that and it worked perfectly. But it was really a, a marvelous achievement of deep no diplomacy and, and perseverance from, from, our, from, from President Pasikiv to get it done. And then we just threw it away. But <clears throat> the thing was that to your question, so what happened was the massive propaganda operation run over the Finnish populace. Re you, you really steering the fears of Finnish, of, and then no actual discussion what joining NATO would mean at this point. NATO is a peace organization, NATO is blah, 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 we are never have to be alone, blah, 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 and these, these, were, these were spread out. And I think it was the 4th of February, 22, President Niinistö said in an interview that going into NATO without a referendum is, is, a, is a foolish, foolish idea which will, which will never be done. You, you need, he said that you need the people to be heard. And just three months after he had completely turned around and we had no general discussion, no general election, no, no referendum, nothing. We didn't, the people of Finland were not asked. We could have still, if, even if we would have had a rep referendum, we could have still gone into NATO, I think from a very slim margin, but at least we would have had the discussion and we did it. So I would say that Finns, as 
Nice but gullible people, as many of them are, were tricked into NATO as the next Ukraine for a cannon fodder. I think that's, that's how it looks to me now. And, and preparations are currently being made, with, which I can only see as preparations for uh, war against Russia. Can you elaborate on that? Well, they are building NATO bases, for example, what I hear. This is, this is not publicly discussed, but I, I have my sources. They are building NATO bases. And Russia explicitly, President Putin explicitly said, after Finland has had joined the NATO, that they have no problem with this. Do what you wish. But we have a problem if you have a NATO infrastructure in Finland. And there was actually, uh, I think it was last spring, or fall. Anyway, we had a, the strangest discussion, uh, a public discussion that could Finland harbor nuclear weapons. And I started quite a massive campaign in, in Twitter and social media to explain the nuclear deterrence to our president, to our then Prime Minister uh, Mari. And I explained that if you have nuclear weapons like 200 kilometers from St. Petersburg, you, which you can launch from you know, artillery, from, from jets, you don't have any defense capability and the early warning system even won't work. And in that case, Russia would react. This was the same as the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. US knew if, if, if the missiles are just like 100 kilometers from, uh, from their coast, they, they can strike without any warning. So don't go long Finnish assets. For now, no, I wouldn't go. Long. No, no, that's don't go. Long. No, it's 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 more the other way around. If you have sell, I would say because it, it's it's not looking good, and I dearly hope that this will not happen. But <clears throat> it's actually the war mongering is so heavy now, and the, you know we are now in part of this great NATO, and this applies to Poland, and for example, for example, Estonia also. So I do worry, and. People in Finland don't really understand. Only in Europe, they don't, they don't seem to understand what's about to come unless we stop this process. And we have like, we had had like two major wars starting from, of course, we have a series of wars in Europe. But two world wars has, have started from Europe. And, and like the first I mean, war, objectively, yeah. every century in Europe, we have a major war that runs yeah. across the parts of the continent at least. At least, yeah. I wouldn't say amusing, I'd rather say disturbing that Europeans nowadays think that they're somehow beyond war, like it's yeah. something that was just in the past, as if the, the quality of our politicians had improved, yeah. as if people's understanding of history had improved, as if people were more reasonable than in the mm. past centuries. Because when I compare people now and people, I mean, from what I could read before, I don't get the feeling that people now are more reasonable and are more averse to putting themselves in situations that lead to war. Probably not. And like this is a like before World War One, there were many close calls, but people thought also then that we, we are above the war. We, it doesn't come anymore. Politics will reign. And then one week it took when our whole continent was at a as a blaze starting from the shooting of Franz Ferdinand in, in Yugoslavia, from a small event, and then a, a, a cascading a process of events with all the like defense clauses triggering and all this. And we didn't work, we were in a war. So if you think, if you consider now how the uh, line or the border between Russia and NATO goes, you have to ask yourself what, what needs to happen mm -hmm. for the defense clause action, uh, uh, close, what is it called, close, close, yeah, number five on NATO treaty will be triggered. Sm any small thing can just snowball yeah. into... Yeah, it yeah. can snowball. It can start from all kinds of, like, small provocations. But it currently, it, like, it looks like Russia is kind of holding back. It's not responding like Ukraine sending drones or shooting the, the Ukrainian territory, uh, your Russian territory. They're like, okay, well, fine, whatever. But I would probably worry most, uh, most uh, about Poland now. Mm -hmm. 
and they um, what are they planning? But we don't know. But you have to I mean, remember the, the the weapons, the amount of weapons they're ordering is uh, staggering. Yeah, this is the, like if you rearm, it will only lead to war. That's like the that's one clear like lesson from history. Mm -hmm. If you start to prepare for war, it will come. Especially when your name is Poland. And oh you have, yeah, you have yeah. a history of being quite aggressive. Yeah, and and Polish, they had a um, there's like five, I think f about five, uh, like this major existential shocks to to Russia, how Russia Ru Russia views it, or they view it in in the Russian leadership, and Polish had one of those. I think they took the Kremlin or something like that in the in the eighteen uh, hundreds or seventeen so, hundreds uh, or something like that. And then there was the Napoleonic Wars and, and Hitler, Germany effectively trying it two times and all that. So, yeah, so it would fit that Poland would at this, this point. Because Russia has also drawn, and Soviet Union, they have drawn lines over mm -hmm. Poland because that's the part of the peasant, not, mm -hmm. no, not, not, not the safety zone. So uh, it's understandable that, you know, Polish could have something, you know, some issues they sure. want to they want to clarify, but it's a it's a dangerous thing now. And there's like <clears throat> and like people <sighs> wars like they are really if you look at the history of wars they are an extreme point of development. And now it has been such that NATO has been for having a proxy war in in Ukraine, while Russia has been fully engaged. NATO has been gathering intel, mostly, but Russia has gathered intel, put in action, test and tried all this. Like, I saw an interview from a, from a, uh, uh, a woman, a Ukrainian soldier, yesterday, who explained the Lancet drones, which are very cheap, but they have become very effective of destroying even the most uh, prestigious and... and uh, uh, um, well-protected Western tanks by targeting the weak spots, which I, was, uh, I had my mandatory military service at the Armored Brigade, so I know how tanks are <laughs> being destroyed. And she said that there's basically no point of sending tanks in the front line because they will be destroyed. The several, the hundreds of thousands, even millions cost in tanks will be destroyed by these drones, which cost, I don't know, a few hundred euros to make. And we have already lost this war. And getting, if there would now be an open front war with Russia and NATO, we would start from, we would be seriously like back. Russia would be here, but we would start from a serious distance to get even to their uh, level of military capabilities at the moment. So they, they've been ramping up, uh, they're yeah. building up their army. There's only a fraction of their soldiers on the front. Yeah. Um, and they're just building, building, building. building. They it's, are building. Uh, it's yeah. scary. Yeah, it's about, I think the current rate of tanks is about 1,000 something per year. And they're not building like any cheap tanks. One is T90 Armatas and T40, not uh, the T40 Armatas and T90. The, well, anyway, well, they have so many uh, development versions, but they are building this. And they are preparing because they see a threat, I think. And there is actually <clears throat> uh, not many outside Nordics probably know that, but know this. But uh, Kremlin has made two uh, uh, nuclear bombing simulation run simulations to Stockholm with bombers. First one was in 2013, and I think they got about 50 kilometers in the uh, Swedish zone. There was just bombers doing a bombing run, and then they turn away. And the next one was in uh, late March 2020. And according to, the Na according to NATO, at least, I think the second one, they had actual nuclear bombs on board. So I think this was a warning of showing what will happen if we would go head to head in, in a nuclear confrontation. So if you have, like the Baltic Sea, is a narrow sea. Seventy percent of all Finnish imports exports come from there. And there's a uh, 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 Oland or small islands, 
hold by switch in the middle, and then there's Kalinin crowd, which is now control, which is kind of a tip. So there's a can expand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the Russians have it, and I think the plan would be. I heard also this from the intelligence sources that Russians would take all over uh, no Gotland, Gotland is the southern at all, and Gotland, and then drop a nuke on Stockholm. And if you nuke Stockholm, you basically you demobilize whole you, uh, whole Nordics. It it would like you know checkmate. You have this. You have control of the Baltic Sea. Finland is here alone. Force her or us to negotiate. And I think what they would do it is to, of course, to why why would the Kremlin show this thing? I think it's the only reason is is a warning that don't go on this path. And and to openly show what what you are planning, and it's it would be very difficult to defend that. But I first I couldn't understand why the, sim, the, the bombing runs were simulated or done. But then when you start to look at the whole picture, the big picture, you, know, you understand this. Oh, it, it, it makes sense. It, it becomes clear. Although uh, we can of course go in the head of President Putin and say this is what he was doing. But mm -hmm. usually, in these situations, you signal like this. Cool. So the implication for 2024 would be don't go long assets on in countries potentially on the front line with Russia. No. So if you want to invest in Europe, stick to what Hungary, Turkey, Spain, Portugal, <laughs> Possib southern Italy. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, possibly Norway. I don't know if it's far enough, but you know. yeah, it's pretty close up there. Right? Yeah, it's still <laughs> close. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, but that, yeah, generally. Generally, cool. Yeah, ri risk some risk averse. Un yeah. Unless you have an amazing deal. Um, yeah, that, that would be your take. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Interesting. Um, what about the what about the Middle East? Because this one is ongoing, it's raging. Um, I don't feel we're getting that much information from it. No. Um, but it's it's it doesn't seem to be calming down no. at all. I do. Israel seems to be pushing hard now on Gaza on all fronts, and I I am just wondering or worrying that when our Arab countries have been very, like. Um, cool-headed, and I do worry that when that changes, the whole region will just blow up. And its implications would be harrowing. Like, if we think about the Strait of Hormuz, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, what sees it connects the Persian Gulf, and the, uh, I have a very bad name, memory anyway, but it's, it's a very crucial because uh, I think it was one-third of all LNG comes through it, about one-sixth of all oil, global. And the really interesting thing is that Qatar exports, I think it's what, about 66 million uh, uh, cubic meters through it in a year. European Union requires about 44 million uh, cubic meters of LNG this year just to warm. Uh, uh, or to operate, and the world free spare uh, LNG is about 56. So if Iran would close the Strait of Hormuz, I think Europe would freeze. So, and the LNG market would, you know, go ballistics. Uh, and, you know, th these, are, these are the risks we are currently playing in that region. And they, uh, I, I heard just yesterday that U.S. administration would have told Israel that it has till the beginning of almost the end of January to complete the operation, and then they, you know, so this is a good sign. But because the aims of Israel are unclear now, we don't know what they are actually aiming. But if if you look at how they are treating Gaza, it's a, uh, I don't know, it, it's it, what I've heard, what I've seen is it's complete demolition. Of that area, and what will happen to the Palestinians? Where do they go? There's an e Egyptian leader, Sisi said uh, last week or, or or during the weekend, or how was it that they, if the Palestinians are pushed or the people from Gaza are pushed into into Sinai, there will be consequences. 
And so I don't think that they, I think they are they are playing with fire there. And they always do. People always yeah. play with fire in the Middle East. Yeah, they always do. Yeah, but this time I think it's worse than for a long time. It's yeah. interesting that it's 50 years ago there was the Yom Kippur War. Mm -hmm. It started like one day after mm -hmm. this current one. It's a yeah. quite a remarkable coincidence. What are the odds? Yeah, and uh, that led to the inflation shock, the oil embargo, inflation shock, all that. And the ravaging inflation of the 1970s. And then to the Volcker era, interest rate rises to 21%. And if you would what think, if you would just think what would happen to the U.S. economy if, if interest rates would go to 20 now. So long South American oil producers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now the thing is now if, if you if you if if we go a bit further of the uh, conflict in in the Middle East, if there would be an inflation shock. Really, an energy shock. You know, they they all embargo, shutting the trade of hormones or something. Prices would start to rise again, probably massively. At the same same time, we would have a recession mm -hmm. coming in the U.S. Europe is now already in the one. So, with a recession, high interest rates. So what would central banks do? What I've been thinking is that they would they, they would go completely. They could go completely schizophrenic, like they would start the interest rates. But at the same time, when financial markets collapse, they would start printing also. A like complete not strategy, but that would be thinking what the Fed has done. That is what they could do, actually. So, and in this case, the printing would need to be massive. I, I would say it would be in the range of tens of trillions. And then, we'll, then we'll, what we would have is an inflation shock, massive monetary shock, and. If there would be like OPEC as an objection stepping out of the petrodollar, you would suddenly have a, a shitload of dollars in the world. And if you go through this projection of thinking, there is a risk of hyperinflation in the US at the end of this. That's the worst case. And like, we should be very, very very careful, very, very, what the central banks are going to do next. Because they created this mess and they have very limited tools to respond of things that are about to come. So it's not just war that will come. We, have, we can reach very detrimental scenarios, also economically and financially, in this sense. But generally, during fast inflation, so stock markets have done well. <laughs> so, but of course, we don't know how the recession effect. So I'm just saying that we have, we have been not really forecasting GDP growth for about two years because the uncertainty is too high. We provide something, we provide estimate, but make clear that these are, I guess, estimates. Mm -hmm. And uncertainty of what could happen in 2024 or the next year, I don't think it has been ever this higher since the 19 like maybe 40s, mm -hmm. massive uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And people do not seem to realize it. Yeah. Yeah, and they, um, the one other thing I think people are not, do not generally understand is the situation in the banking world. So we were expecting the banking crisis to emerge already in late 2020 or 2021. That's that's basically the one big forecast we got wrong, but it, it was just a timing issue. So when the banking crisis emerged in uh, in September, late September 22, uh, it was a, a bit difficult for people to understand what actually happened, but there was a situation when there were these um, companies associated with British pension funds whose responsibility was to uh, acquire stable funding streams uh, for the pension funds to pay for the, for the salaries and, and, and the pension salaries. And the thing was that they had heavily invested in, in, in guilds, uh, that is the UK government bonds, and with the rapid inflation and the, and the rapid interest rate hiking cycle, their values had collapsed. So there was a threat of a, uh, uh, a marching call for the whole 
expense and interest in, in the UK, which would have led to fire sales of assets of these funds, of guilds and all that, which would have crushed their value even further. And as they were all, you know, banks and all held these uh, guilds as a, uh, well, as an, as an dependable or, uh, assets uh, or collateral, uh, it would have led to a, a serious trouble in the banking sector. And so uh, the Bank of England was forced to tap in and start to buy guilds to stop the margin calls. So basically, and the, U, uh, and the UK uh, pension industry, they hold the assets are something like 3.1 trillion uh, pounds. So it, have, it, have, it would have caused a massive strike. In the uh, or hit in the uh, in the global financial system, and at the same time, like this was this crisis began uh, or was averted. I think it was 28th of September, and then I was actually in conference in in Budapest. I got a call on Saturday that have you heard that credit is is in trouble, uh, or that it was uh, actually it, the call the call was that there is a, there's a big Swiss bank in, in trouble and okay, then you just have to, there's two. <laughs> so what was it then? It was Credit Sys. And they also were able to refund them, terms, recapitalize themselves and, and all that. So it was averted at that point, but it started at the end of September 2022, 20, the banking crisis. And then it, the second wave came in the US in, in mid-March. Uh, 20, this year, and it was the failures of Silicon Valley Bank, uh, Signature Bank, uh, Silvergate, and then the uh, First Republic Bank. They all failed within a uh, period of was it four weeks. But the thing is, thing was that it was actually funny, you know. It's just uh, we've been warning about this banking crisis for for a very long time, and then I remember we had a. Uh, uh, I had a very busy weekend. It was the 10th of March. Yeah, 10th of March, Friday. I had a very busy weekend with all kinds of get-togethers and parties. Uh, so I, I remember that I checked Twitter the last time about 5 uh, p.m. Finnish time, and there was, okay, there was a title, Silicon Valley Bank in Trouble. I look at regional lender in, in Silicon Valley, failed capital acquisition. And I was like, ah, okay. Probably nothing. <laughs> and then a weekend went and gone, and then Monday morning, I finished time over my computer, I was like, oh. <laughs> so what has happened? And during the night, like they, the first uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation took over, uh, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank in New York, and they, uh, then uh, uh, on Sunday, the US authorities and lawmakers decided that this is not enough. So on Monday, they had this barrage of, of measures. First, the Federal Reserve set up the um, uh, bank term funding program, or BTFP, which essentially offered one-year loans to banks against any collateral, any reasonable collateral, basically bonds and all that. And, and then, um, the FDIC uh, guaranteed all the deposits in the Fed banks. And as a last measure, and I watched, I watched this live, President Biden came to television on, on Monday morning US time to tell people that your deposits are safe. And at that point I was like, <laughs> at that point I understood that there was a risk of a nationwide wide bank run on the regional banks. I was like, oh, <laughs> and, and right after that, we sent a warning to our clients that this is serious. But they, were managed, they, they managed to stop the runs. But people have to understand that they threw a kitchen sink at it. Really, these are highly exceptional measures taken by the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, and even the Biden administration. And <clears throat> the failure of the Silicon Valley Bank was mostly because they did what the authorities said, them, said they would do. Lockdowns uh, and the stimulus checks and the massive, massive money print by the Federal Reserve 
caused a, a kind of a, led to a massive inflow of deposits in the banks, especially the regional banks. And this is like if you look at the series of demand deposits, it's like it grows very steadily about one thousand five hundred billion dollars in a period of about twenty years, and then in two years it goes to five thousand billion. Makes absolutely no sense. There's a massive, massive explosion. And the balance sheet of banks works like you have to balance it somehow. So you need to have assets. And so you can give out loans or buy securities to the balance sheet. And authorities wanted, basically they forced banks to hold US treasuries. So for example, Silicon Valley Bank brought treasuries. And then, and usually treasuries are bought as held to maturity assets, which means that they are not, they, they are, you don't, whatever happens to the value, you don't account them to do your income statement because you just wait that they mature and then you get the money back with interest. But then, the, then there was just a panic of some, uh, it, it started from a, uh, f the failed capital accusation and people just started to withdraw their funds from Silicon Valley Bank. And they were forced to sell some of the shelter maturity assets, report a loss, and then all hell broke loose. But the thing is that the, the treasuries, as, as you think about like two-year treasury, the yield went from around 0 0.2 to 5 in, 5% 5 in two years. You put that in a discount formula and you have a bond with no value, basically. Of course, it didn't. It doesn't go like between or uh, interbank markets. Of course, the, I think the yield was something like one percent, and then it. But still, losses were massive. And so the Silicon Valley Bank failed because it did what authorities wanted it to do. It was strange to see like these prominent figures of blaming the banks of bad risk management because you all, all who has done a, even a very little, uh, even a small amount of, of deri derivative action know how difficult it is to hedge a, a, a uh, yield risk in, in treasuries. It's not an easy task. Even now, if, if now someone would ask me how to do it, I, I would need to think for a while. So you can really blame the banks. They did what the Federal Reserve has established the Basel Committee, which gives these international uh, guidelines for banks. Uh, they did what they wanted. But okay, so this was the one thing. But the other thing is that the failure of the First Republic Bank, it, it was really interesting, and this happened early April, because it had massive losses from the real estate. If I remember correctly, it had like 80% of its loan portfolio came from the real estate, the commercial real estate combined. And so it took massive losses. And it had chosen a different strategy than Silicon Valley Bank when the deposit inflow came, or influx. Uh, it gave out loans. And it gave out loans to, you know, real estate sector. And then they started to really crash their value, defaults, delinquencies, all that. So they start, started taking a, a, a heavy hit. On their, on, on their income, and it went strong and negative. And then, uh, uh, because they didn't have so much securities, they could acquire only 13 billion from the bank term funding program of the Fed, and they failed as a result. So they didn't get in, get, did not get enough liquidity to cover the deposit outflow and flat, failed. And once again, the um, deposit, uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation took over the bank. There's now, U.S. banks ha, are now being hit by both the, uh, the unrealized losses from the treasury holdings and then massive losses on loans. And we actually run a scenario, scenarios on, on uh, third quarter data uh, in our latest outlook published at the end of November. We had the soft landing scenario, we had the global financial crisis 2.0 scenario, and we had the repetition of Great Depression scenario. And in the Great Depression scenario, we basically, we had the assumption that 15% of CRA loans will default and about 43% of mortgages. And this was based on what happened in Great Depression. 
And in that scenario, and we also, and, and so basically the unrealized losses were uh, uh, negligible in, in, uh, or not, it didn't affect on the um, failure of banks. But the loan, because the loan losses were so massive. But out of the 4,669 banks in this scenario, 4,305 failed. So it's a, it's a theoretical thing. Sure. Because they will never allow these things to go so bad. Print. Yeah, yeah. there's print. But the problem is that the, the the loan losses will be utterly massive. So there is a risk that if the authorities fail to contain the new panic, which is coming probably in the in the spring. Why? Why specifically in the spring? Um, because recession is coming. It's just this is a, this is a guess. You cannot really exactly time the onset of financial crisis because it's a psychological feature that drives them fear. So you just you you guess. And uh, usually when recession comes, people notice that there's a recession. They start to worry about banks, and it what this is what causes the runs. That's how it usually goes in uh, historical at least. So that's. My current guess estimate or R is that it will start sometime in the spring. And if authorities lose control of it, the, the panic go nationwide, then we could see a repetition of the Great Depression. Especially if something happens in the Middle East, that we, which, which pushes it. Authorities have to stop this or rather limit it. They're already in use. And if the federal government would issue that it, it will guarantee all the deposits in the U.S. banking system, I don't know whether that threat would be credible in the eyes of the populace because there is like uh, 15,000 billion or something, uh, was it 17, on, in the, in the deposits in the U.S. banking system. Part of this is this has been created by the Federal Reserve through the quantitative programs of quantitative easing. But if, if, if that doesn't work, Basically, they have only the financial lockdown left, where they just simply say that you cannot raise that more than like 50 bucks a day. They did in Greece. And then they could issue a bailing of banks also. That mm -hmm. legislation has been put in place in 2008. Yeah. And so. And all over Europe. Yeah, and this does, yeah, both in the US and in Europe, because they will play together. So. The kind of a warning thing here is that you have to be very careful where to put your money. We will publish the list probably this week of the 270 banks that survive the credit depression scenario. And we consider those to be the most reliable banks in the US. Interestingly, there is not a, not a single big bank in it. Everyone fails in that, every big bank, which of course means that it will not happen. Anyway, we will publish that and then we hope to get something similar done for Europe for the, uh, uh, during the spring. But the, you, you have to, people will need to understand that this banking risk, crisis risk is, is very real. And the only thing that the Federal Reserve, first the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve, only thing what they did is that pushed the crisis back under the surface. Where, it's, where it continues to grow. Citizens Bank failed just a few weeks ago, small bank in, in Iowa. And they, but what's very uh, interesting about that failure is that it was mostly related to massive losses of, of trucking loans. So there are these asymmetries in regional banks. And now that different sections of US economy are collapsing, there will be asymmetric loan loss hits. So you have to be very careful about that also if you're operating in the in the US banking system. And they and the thing is that the FDIC has taken really drastic steps to stop or immediately take over the bank and the deposits to completely stop any speculation of further runs. And you just have to ask if these bank failures keep on coming for how long are they able to do it with this efficiency and at what point the trust of people, the banks breaks. Because that is what happened in the Great Depression, which is actually just a major, major global financial crisis. So this is, this is another thing people really should 
be considered about the sector. There are massive geopolitical risks, but then there's the, the financial sector. The sector is fragile, and, and you need to account that in your uh, uh, risk control scenarios. Well, that sounds lovely. 2024 sounds lovely. Thank you. 2024, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, really nice. <laughs> of course, it, it, it could be that nothing happens, but, yeah. I, yeah, but the likelihood of, like, if you pile a, a detrimental development over detrimental development, mm -hmm. at some point, the dam will break, yeah. and then they may happen all at the same time, yeah. creating other chaos if you are not prepared. Mm -hmm. And if, if there's a, if, and let uh, let me add this: if there is one more round, like in banking crisis, that the Federal Reserve or whatever ECB or whoever can stop, then that's the last warning shot. Then you need to understand that run to the hills, basically. Mm -hmm. Look, in the past um, two years since the since the war started, I've been gradually reducing my exposure to Europe. Mm -hmm. And investing more in Latin American markets, um, where it's essentially cash valuations, where there mm. isn't any leverage in the system, mm. because I feel that there is a lot less potential downside in these markets. Yeah. When I'm buying prime real estate for eleven hundred dollars a square meter, mm. I don't feel like the downside is that much compared to if I were to buy in downtown Helsinki, for example, yeah. where there is you know, a lot of leverage. Um, and a threat of war. Yeah, a <laughs> threat of war, yeah. Which doesn't bode well with, you know, real estate. Yeah. Um, so, look, I think people just need to take a step back um, and just acknowledge that risk is higher than it mm. has been um, in the past decades, probably, mm. that that risk is not being properly priced in because we don't, really understand what that sort of risk means anymore. Yeah. Um, and that people should be cautious, be reasonable, and I think really what's important is to be diversified, um, not only in terms of your investments, but also in terms of residencies, et cetera, so that you know, if things were to take a bad turn, there's always a place you can go to that is, that is a bit safer. And so you've been here for essentially this purpose here in mm. El Salvador. Yeah. You've been doing a bit of recon work mm. on the ground um, with some business partners of yours. What are your thoughts on this week that you've spent here in El Salvador? Well, because this is, when we look online, we see Bukele, Bitcoin, blah, 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 yeah. blah. What have you? I've just been here. I arrived here last night, so I yeah. really haven't seen yeah. anything okay. yeah. apart from that steak place you took me to last night. <laughs> um, so very, very good steak. It was good yeah. steak. Yeah, yeah very yeah. good steak. Um, so what are your thoughts? Yeah, it is like I'm a trained growth economist. So which means that I've been trained to analyze economic growth. And then I added economic crisis to it in, during my late, later stage of my PhD studies. And so I always when I go to a new country, I, I look for certain things. One is my own crane index. By, by landing, how many cranes you see. You don't see much of them here yet. No. Mm -hmm. But that masks the development in the, in the ground, so on the ground. So, what has been really striking for me that every turn, turn I had here, it has been a positive, positive surprise. So how people are, how, how things are done here in an effort to grow the country and make this a good place to be, to live and to prosper and, and do business in, in, in a free market setup. So on Thursday, I actually met the Minister of the Economy and the Minister of Tourism. And we had a nice, nice, um, longish talk, uh, and, and they asked, you know, well, they asked me how I see it and, and what are my proposals, and um, yeah, and we, they, it was a very product, productive meeting. Like when you meet government official ministers, many of them in Europe uh, or in Western countries have their own idea already. Yeah, they, so, they're not into listening. Yeah, they are just looking for a ways, ways to enforce their own view. This was different. We really talked and they listened and it left me a really good feeling that they are really trying to make this country grow and be a better place to live and stay and all that. So they have, this country within this week has kind of convinced me of these potentials. And we're actually, we're setting up a company here now, uh, uh, two Finnish partners and, and 
uh, one guy from here who helps people and businesses to come here to operate. So if you're interested, you know, just, just get in touch. Details below. Yeah, details below. So, and they, um, yeah, so it's it's been a really positive thing. I'm like, I, I, this has made me happy <laughs> Good. to see. And, and the one thing is that the, the people are really working hard in an effort to, to, uh, to build the country and their lives. Mm-hmm. And my friend who is uh, originally from El Salvador, but has lived in, in many countries, uh, also in the, in the US, said that it's because people have not tasted freedom for a long time. Mm-hmm. And when they finally get it, they really try go for it. it. You go for it. And the people here are so nice. And, they, uh, uh, and, and the strangest thing is that I have never felt threatened here. Mm-hmm. Of course, I, I've been in the central, but we have been going all around the, uh, both the city and, and, the, uh, and the country. And when I first left to this trip, I ar- arrived, I went to Dallas. I wanted to see Dallas for the first time, go to JFK Museum, all that. And the first night in central Dallas, Dallas downtown was a bit of a shock. There was so much homelessness, aggressive people, mixed users, all that. Like, I was like, no. This is not the U.S. I remember because I have lived in the U.S. in 2010, for example, and it, it was a changed country in many ways. So I go back now to um, to Fort Worth, and Nashville, and New York, and we'll see how how they are. But the difference was really striking to come here because you know something bad has happened to the U.S. like many European countries, but it's 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 going the other side, other other way here. Yeah, because when you look at the, I mean, you're, you're, you're an economist, you, you would know better than me. Um, but when you look at the macro indicators here for, for El Salvador, there's a large current account deficit. Mm. The country is entirely reliant on remittances. Mm. Um, the level of investment, sure, it's going up, but not that mm. much yet. No. Yeah. Um, the export profile of the country is essentially just tourism, agriculture. Yeah. Um, it's very primitive. Yeah. Um, a bit of services through call centers and yeah. the like. Um, so when you look just purely at the macro indicators, mm-hmm. it's not impressive. No. But of the people I've interacted with since I arrived last night, so <laughs> the taxi driver for one hour I was talking <laughs> with them, optimism, talking about all yeah. the foreigners that are coming, yeah. um, investments, etc. You, you could feel he was welcoming yeah. foreigners and investments and understood the importance of foreigners coming to his country. Uh, then I chatted with the with the receptionist. Yeah. Um, he was saying that the hotel is, is packed all yeah. the time. Um, I chatted with some ladies at the at the at breakfast and they were happy because they say now it's safe, they can walk around at night, yeah. etc. Um, after our dinner, I mm. walked 40 minutes from yeah. our restaurant um, through alleys and streets not lit yeah. back to my hotel, which a few years ago would have been utterly unthinkable in, suicide, in El Salvador. Suicide mission. Yeah, just yeah. suicide mission. Just, yeah. And I'm there with, with my phone. It's just yeah. nothing. Um, and we, you left from the kind of the kind of the best scale area to walk. Yeah. And actually, we went to downtown a few nights ago with a friend, and he told me that just a few years ago, going there, would be a, a suicide mission. Yeah. And it's like great to see in the downtown, you see development, I get really you know, <laughs> excited about these things. They have cleaned the very central and there's a new, new library, but you see the border where the kind of, uh, of, of not so good things start. Mm-hmm. And now when I come back the next time, it'll be interesting to see where that, has, where that mm-hmm. border has you know, moved to. So little by little, and I met the, actually in the in the conference uh, with the ministers. There was also one official who was responsible uh, for the development of the city center. I will I will not go into details how she is doing it, but it was a, it is a great plan, uh, and I'm sure that it will develop further. They have a one serious deficit, two serious deficits basically here, which is that not so many speak English. For me, who doesn't speak any Spanish, that's a problem. They are fixing that also, and then El Salvador it needs a metro bad yeah the traffic the traffic is horrible and but <clears throat> coming back to like this is a um, there's a uh, states pre crane 
states, which basically El Salvador is now. They're building stuff on the ground, especially in this area and anywhere. They're putting the uh, massive amounts of electric wire and all that wire into the ground, cleaning spots off and all that. So the crane index will come. And the, really the macroeconomic indicators are not so impressive, but that's like a development, a train development economy. I, I want to go into a country to see what's really happening on the ground, talk with people, sense the vibe. These are much more important because macroeconomic indicators, you can fix them if yeah. you get the grow going and all that. So there's a, there's a, there's a lot of positive things. And then, there, there, you know, some writers have been very aggressive about the gangs all put in the prison and thrown away the key. But this is a question I think uh, Western nations will soon need to ask. Mm -hmm. That if there are individuals who are committed to murder and rape, do we need to allow them the same freedoms as we have? They have made their choice. And rehabilitation of such people may not never succeed. And it's, I know it's a difficult question come to human rights and all that, but they are not killing them or anything. They are just storing them away from disturbing the society. And the change... Isn't that what the Bolsheviks said about uh, people uh, when they put them in camps? Yeah, yeah. That's, so, yeah, you have this. I understand. You have this. But uh, uh, this is a question we really need to ask. And they were not like, okay, Bolsheviks, they put all dissidents, which is quite different. But I know this is a difficult issue, but here it has worked and there would probably have been a, a, no other way. So combining the macro elements and what you're seeing on the ground, you feel that we could be approaching an inflection point here in El Salvador? Yes, when the growth, after the, when the growth really picks up after it. So we are, we are closing it. I think it's just a few good moves away. And I, I, I actually, I will publish probably tomorrow or today. A, I have a long Twitter uh, post written of where, which includes the recommendations, which are basically said to the said to ministers also, and issues that the El Salvador need to take. Link then, below. Yeah, and and then uh, which will guarantee that they will, you know. Get growth. I will, there, there are some, I know small details which they are. I will naturally. I will not go into them here, or explain and which which were kind of legal things relating to uh, how to operate at the business here and all that. But they are. The main point is that they are fixing everything they see needs to be fixed, and they want people, professionals like me, when they come here, they want to hear what they have to say, mm -hmm. and that's the best sign for me that this government is doing its best. And like, you should not make friends with governments. That's not how it goes. But if you have a good government, you can support it. Because it's, it seems that it's definitely for the people. And what about asset prices? Because I'm here actually to go have a look at real estate, etc. Mm -hmm. To see if um, assets are still affordable. So if we're in an inflection point, if assets are still affordable, it's worth it. But maybe have they gone up yet? Yeah, in certain places they have gone up really heavily, and uh, unfortunately, the um, asset speculators have already arrived a bit before, and they are—they can be really, well, heinous people. Actually, it's it. You, are you talking about me? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I hope, <laughs> but you know who who they, they are not here to build; they are here to reap uh, yeah. the benefits, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the worst kind of this uh, of people, and these always appear when the country opens up and cleans. That's how it goes, yeah. human nature, you cannot help it. And maybe here the Bitcoiners, which some have become rich for doing absolutely nothing than buying a, a, a virtual asset at, you, you, know. you sound bitter because you didn't buy Bitcoin. <laughs> no, no, no. He's bitter, he's a bitter <laughs> no, professor, okay. he's a bitter <laughs> professor. <laughs> no, okay, no, but, I, <laughs> but, I, uh, but yeah, no, you, there, if you come rich, like people winning the lottery are the same. Basically, so you, you, there is something like becoming quickly rich, so some, it corrupts some people. And you unfortunately see examples of that here. So what I propose to the ministers, for example, is that an incentive structure, I'm, I'm not keen of the regulations, but something that would, if you invest here, you would build the community, not just like 
buy a land and wait that it appreciates and then sell it to Marriott or whatever, you know, uh, 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 this uh, um, hotel change or what you know, the thing. So, and this is something like, I hope that this is a trap El Salvador avoids. So they are able to not lead to American Americans and whoever are fleeing here just to make this as their own, you know, paradise in the uh, in the Pacific, but so they don't really develop the country. Mm -hmm. And that's a bit of a challenge. But there is a, a lot of affordable property here now. So and the time here to to come here is now. Mm -hmm. Because it soon it will be gone, the opportunity. Cool. And so All right. that's a, you know. fantastic. Look, Professor, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. So if you're interested in finding out more about Dr. Malinin's services, and if you want to follow him, um, there is a Twitter link below. There is also a link to his Substack, which is really good, and a link to his research services. Yeah, thank you. All right. Yeah. Professor, real pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks. Make sure to download my free ebook, 12 Mistakes to Avoid When Investing in International Real Estate, which you can find on my website, link below. And feel free to follow me on Instagram at The Wandering Investor. I look forward to hearing from you.